Welcome to Building Worldviews, a podcast by Praxis Circle, featuring scholars, thinkers, and more, engaging in conversation as you shape your worldview. I'm May Lily Lee. These episodes originate from video interviews you can find on the website, praxiscircle.com. Become a member by registering at the website and subscribe or follow this podcast for the latest episodes. On today's episode, it's the second of a two-part conversation with Heather McDonald, New York Times bestselling author. As a former investigative journalist, she's now the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor of City Journal. Heather joins Praxis Circle's Doug Monroe to wade into several cultural controversies, including race, gender, feminism, and higher ed. Let's listen. So let's move on to the diversity delusion, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, now, I gotta take my glasses off and see how I wanna get into this. Um, I think you're making two basic arguments in that book. One is that, I I want you to answer the question, why is it a delusion to seek diversity? And I think I'm coaching you a little bit, which which you don't need, but you're basically saying that if the the goal is to create a student population that reflects the the statistical population, it's a delusion that that's gonna happen. Can you explain that? Yes, I, we can either have diversity or we can have meritocracy. At this point in time, we cannot have both because the academic skills gap is so large. The reason we're talking about diversity uh, is because a colorblind meritocratic system will not generate uh, a racially proportionate student body or workforce. And the reason that it won't is not because there's implicit bias or there's racism on the part of admissions officers or faculty hiring committees. It's because the academic skills gap are so big. The average black 12th grader reads at the level of the average white 8th grader. 43% of black 8th graders do not possess even partial mastery of 8th grade math. Uh, The recent ACT exams showed that 6% of black 12th graders are college ready in math and science and history, 6%. Uh, And yet, uh, we have schools with much, much higher percentage of of black students and their student body because they are bringing them in under greatly lowered academic standards which sets them up to fail. Uh, So, the. You know, the, I, I don't want to be held to the title, you know, I didn't necessarily come up with that, but, but I would say uh, among the many delusions in the diversity ideology is the idea that America today is systemically biased. That is completely false. Black privilege is the reality, not white privilege. There's not a single mainstream institution in this country that is not tying itself into knots to admit and promote as many minorities as possible that is not incentivizing managers to promote minorities uh, against qualifications. You know, you can talk to people that are in the corporate world that will tell you sotto voce their stories about having to promote less qualified minorities and they don't do well and so you sort of establish a firewall around them. Uh, This is most scary in the science fields the, the optimists or the naive among us thought that meritocracy would inevitably, in, you know, in, in, uh, ad infinitum hold firm in the STEM fields. It is not. Uh, medical school admits black students with MCAT scores that would be automatically disqualifying if presented by whites and Asians. Those students either fail and drop out, or if they stick around, they're passed onwards because nobody wants to be accused of racism if they're not promoting blacks through residencies and into professoriates or, or, or labs or into hospitals. Um, and so this is very, very worrisome. Uh, and, and it is, again, it's a lie, here I am invoking truth, to say that we are 
discriminating against qualified minorities. Google, the big tech companies, they are scouring the planet for competitively qualified underrepresented minorities that they can hire and promote. Nobody, no black engineer, no black physicist is being denied a job because he's black. To the contrary, he has every job offer in the world being presented to him on a, on a gold platter that he can choose. It's the white males uh, today who are being screwed. Uh, we are literally culling whites from institutions because we think that uh, you know, they are a, a scourge on, on civilization and the bearers of oppression, which is ridiculous. The other, the other thing, and of course that reflects my experience totally, uh, you know, ever since we, we went to school about the same times and, and you know, I went into the, the job world and at every turn in the road we strove to, to um, do the exact, to do reverse discrimination. There's yep. absolutely no question about that. Now I am in a professional sector of finance and law and business and finance and uh, M&A, but that's a fact. And, right. and so I just... Uh, your book really brought the stats out and that was fantastic. The other thing that you did so well there besides causation, and I'll, we'll get to that, is the growth in um, the staff at universities uh, amongst faculty members who never see a student that hang out in the administration building. That in and of itself was a staggering eye-opener to a lot of people. They had sensed it was happening but you put it in a way that showed it. And so could you comment on that? Well, the diversity bureaucracy is huge. You know, we, we treat tuitions as naturally occurring phenomena and the colleges get off easy. It's remarkable. The colleges are held harmless by public opinion and they think that tuitions just rise of their own accord and the only solution is more college loans from the federal government. Tuitions are a function of the growing bureaucracy and the diversity bureaucracy is a massive part of that. And it's not just faculty who then go into administration, it's full-time administrators that, you know, they have whole PhDs now in student services, which is completely bogus field. It, it exists, I mean, the, a large reason for the growth of this student service bureaucracy is racial preferences, that we are letting students in who are not competitively qualified for the schools in which they find themselves. They're qualified for college, nobody's disputing that. It's just that it is the sad fate of, of black and Hispanic students to be catapulted into academic environments for which they are not competitively qualified with their peers and they struggle. I would struggle if, if MIT, which is totally a left-wing organization now, uh, and it has gender preferences up the gazoo, if and it would admit me to MIT with, let's say, 650 math SATs and all my peers were close to 800, but there I was because I needed to fill a sex quota. I would struggle enormously in my first year calculus class because it would be pitched to the average of my student body. And I would, I would fall behind, I may drop out of a STEM field, I may drop out of MIT, and the bureaucracy would tell me that the reason I'm struggling is because of rape culture. And I would, I would learn to blame my environment and see hostility and sexism all around me. The same thing happens to black students. They struggle, they, they drop out of their STEM intended majors, they, they feel out of place, they congregate in the, in the dining room for, for emotional support, and the bureaucracy tells them the reason you're struggling and feel out of place is because of racism. The institutions would rather blame themselves for phantom racism than tell the truth about racial preferences and truth about the academic skills gap. Um, so the bureaucracy is in large part, you know, we have all these specializations now. We have the first gen bureaucracy, you know, first generation students. Well, the, the World War II GI Bill also brought first generation college students to college and it didn't need a huge bureaucracy for them. Why? Because they were competitively qualified. They were not being admitted to schools where they weren't where they did not possess these qualifications of their peers. So they didn't need this huge bureaucracy. But now, 
first-gen college students is just a euphemism for students who are not academically prepared. And so they get their own hand-holding bureaucracy. Uh, and every other group that wants to claim victimhood gets its own bureaucracy. And there's this codependency between these narcissistic, self-involved victim students and the eager bureaucrats who are a willing audience for their little psychodramas of oppression that the students act out in, in, in front of them. And they both need each other. And it's very telling that whenever the students launch another set of demands on their willing, docile, uh, compliant universities, high up on the list is always an expansion of the diversity bureaucracy. And it's, it's, it's interesting that they realize that these are their supporters and that they're going to sort of give them more fuel uh, to, because they will then support their claims of victimhood. All right, let's, let's go to causation a little bit about how this developed. Um, you do a very nice job of starting out um, talking about how the, the, law, the legal system was used to uh, further affirmative action, uh, starting with the Civil Rights Act. Can you get us through all of that? And it was really used um, across the board in race, sex, um, and those kinds of things. Uh -huh. um, well, the civil rights laws were very quickly uh, hijacked to require racial preferences. And uh, another term is affirmative action, but racial preferences is much more clear. Affirmative action can still be uh, interpreted or translated by, by liberals as simply outreach, which it may have been for two days after the civil rights laws, but it very quickly morphed into lowered standards. Um, it's no, you know, outreach has been going on forever. So, you know, you had the idea that you needed to lower standards to bring blacks into institutions. And, you know, if you insisted on immediate integration to the point of proportional representation, that was true uh, because there was back then as well an academic skills gap. I would say the most pernicious concept that came out of the law was the concept of disparate impact, which was a U.S. Supreme Court case, Griggs v v Duke Power from 1971 that said that even if an employer was not discriminating against minorities, was colorblind uh, and had no intention to discriminate, but had uh, job qualification tests that had a disparate impact on blacks because of the academic skills gap, that unless the employer could justify that under a very high standard of validity, uh, that that, that uh, academic, that jobs qualification had to be tossed. And so what we have now with the concept of disparate impact is that any behavioral or academic standard that has a disparate impact on minorities is being thrown out the window and replaced with double standards. Uh, so the law right now is very happy to tolerate uh, racial preferences and double standards and treating reverse discrimination is the, is the norm. And uh, you know the jurisprudence in equal protection for college preferences is just an absolute nightmare. It's a horror, it's incoherent, it's filled with deceptions and, and uh, fictions that just makes one cry. The whole thing should be tossed out and replaced with the empirical uh, theory of mismatch, which is, as far as I'm concerned, a much more interesting way of getting at uh, racial preferences than equal protection jurisprudence. Did, just a, a quick answer. Do you think that'll be overturned? It seems, I mean, even Sandra Day O'Connor said it'll be overturned one day. I mean, uh, you're basically. I don't know. I'm not a co court watcher, court predictor. I think that there's, the court has a understandable bias towards. Uh, maintaining preference, uh, precedent and is reluctant to overturn precedent. Uh, I, but, but whether the majority on the court now will be willing to do so, I would hope so. It would obviously create a huge furor in the country. Uh, and 
and that will be even more the case with Roe versus Wade. I mean, I, I can't even think what that, what that would bring about. But um, I, I would hope that the court would, would put its weight behind the very powerful mismatch theory as a way to do it, which is to say preferences do not uh, help their beneficiaries, they harm them. And the empirical data is unequivocal about that. Um, let's, let's get into the, to the causes of some of the educational problems that create a lack of supply. Uh, you, you talk about that and you comment as you go quite, quite well. I know what your bias is. Um, say Walter Williams, who's an African-American economist, would, would said, I interviewed him several years ago, he said, when I was in, in school uh, in, in Philadelphia in the ghetto, uh, all, all the, the black children had parents, they stayed married, our schools were often better than the white schools. Um, so what, why is there a lack of supply? Uh, and why do schools like my undergrad in, in, uh, institution, UNC, get into trouble uh, creating African American studies departments that turn out to be shams, that basically their standards fall? And why, why do we have this problem? What? Well, the 60s saw the rise of an oppositional culture uh, in both sort of the larger elite culture but also in black culture where rather than saying we're going to embrace bourgeois values and compete, instead, uh, you know, the ghetto culture started embracing opposition, dysfunction, uh, rejecting hard work and, and academic success as acting white. Uh, and one can ask why that happened. Um, but at this point, there simply is not a very strong ethic of academic effort and achievement in black culture. I mean, there's this, this, sil this conspiracy of silence among public school teachers not to talk about what they're seeing in their classrooms, but it's a nightmare. It's an absolute nightmare in these inner city schools of violence, predation, sexual, you know, just grotesque promiscuity. I, I got in, you know, there was a period where you could still kind of get into public schools. Now they're, they've wised up, but I got into a public school on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and the students were all like sitting with their backs to the teacher and their headphones on, and this was just normal. Uh, the teacher had no authority, and we have this incredibly ridiculous conceit that if black students are, are disciplined more, it's because the teachers are racist. Teachers are the most left-wing profession in the country. Teacher ed school, Columbia Teachers College or Bank Street School of Education is one long two-year marination in, in you know, white privilege theory and multiculturalism and uh, you know, hatred for Western civilization the reason that black kids get disciplined at higher rates is because they're so insubordinate. And they are insubordinate because the family is broken down. Uh, there's women cannot, on average, do as well raising children as the mother and father together. Males are different than females. On average, they bring very different orientations towards child rearing. Uh, on average, again, there's always individual exceptions. But the male, the father, is going to be more insistent on, on courage, on heroism, on risk-taking, on, on sucking things up, and can be a role model for civilized masculinity. You know, there is toxic masculinity. I would not say masculinity is per se toxic. But, you know, when I see these idiots going 100 miles an hour on the freeway or down New York's, you know, 2nd Avenue on a, on a motorcycle, those are idiot males. Uh, and, and that kind of behavior, the positive side of that risk-taking is entrepreneurship and Western civilization and competition and empire building and, and enterprise building. But it needs to be civilized, and marriage civilizes males by raising them in a culture that says in order to be able to have access to a woman's sexual favors, 
Uh, you need to develop the bourgeois virtues of deferred gratification, self-control, make yourself a marriageable mate by making yourself an employable worker. You do not scream at your boss. You do not beat him up. You do not walk off the job in a huff if you can't, if you don't like the authority being directed at you. Uh, and if you want to have regular access towards sex, you need to make yourself a marriageable male. And when the marriage norm breaks down and it becomes the norm in the black community for these young teenage males to go around serially impregnating females and nobody expects them to take responsibility for their children, those males never learned the primary, the very first obligation, the very first human responsibility, which is responsibility for your children. And after that, it's gonna be hopeless to civilize them. Okay, I wanna switch gears a little bit. You, you have several chapters in the same book about um, gender and uh, how the diversity there is, it's a different kind of problem and issue. Could you give a little background on that? That's not a very well-framed question. No, for well, you. I started writing about the, the sex issue in college because of the campus rape epidemic, this idea that colleges were these hotbeds of campus rape, that there's just this you know, tsunami of sexual violence. And uh, I was skeptical to begin with, and uh, when you look at the numbers, it's just clear this is completely fictional. And what you have uh, are these drunken hookups with uh, females deliberately drinking themselves blotto precisely in order to lower their sexual inhibitions so that they can uh, engage in this promiscuous hookup sex. Uh, and it's, again, a, an abdication of personal responsibility. The female then blames the male for regretted sex the next day and claims she was raped. But these are, these, if, if, you, if we want to, as a placeholder, call them rape, they are almost 100% avoidable. Unlike what most people, I still think, think of as real rape, and I'm going to use the term, which would get my head chopped off by the feminists, but I would say real rape is not acquaintance rape. It's, it's a stranger coming into your room uh, through an open window and raping you at knife point or gun point. That's terrifying. Having regretted sex with some guy you met at the frat party, sorry, you know, it's not the end of the world. And, and if you didn't want this to happen, don't do your pre-gaming drinking. Uh, and, and, and hike over every Saturday to the frat house. You know, females are either really stupid or they're lying through their teeth. Because if they weren't stupid and this rape epidemic was going on, there would be universal consensus, don't go to the frat parties. If you guys really believe that they've set aside a rape room, boycott the damn parties. But instead, you can go to UVA, you can go to Rugby Road. Every Saturday, they're trooping over to the frats. So either they're stupid and they literally cannot learn from one week to the next, or there's no rape epidemic going on. And what they know that what's going on is something far more complicated, uh, far more squalid, uh, in which females are trying to ape uh, male brutal sexuality uh, and, then, and then they've got this bureaucracy to take it out on males and try and, and take them down for their own sexual libido. You know, you're talking about my people there. <laughs> 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 At UVA and Duke and Carolina. Yeah. And my daughter was even in school then when some of that the happened and, and was going. And it, it, you know, the funny thing about the Duke uh, lacrosse thing or the, the UVA rape thing is those that are close to the situation read the accounts and knew they were false. Uh -huh. it, it just, you know, it, 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 it was, in and in, in a, it takes a year for that to I come know. out. I know. Um, so anyhow, um, all right. Um, I, I mentioned here, we, we didn't touch a whole lot on uh, you know, the postmodernism thing that you wrote so beautifully about in Mary's book from 2007 about your, it was just humorous, it was light, it was, 
yet pointed and etc. And and you know all that. You were brought up in that well before it was out in the open. I mean, only people at Yale would have known about that in the mid 70s, let's say. Uh, and and then it came out in the 80s. Um, the question is um, the 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 university environment now. The universities that we find today that you write about in the diversity delusion. I'm a normal kid from high school that's from, let's say, a suburban area, a bourgeois area. I don't like that word personally, but that's the one we're using. Or from a rural town that think they're going to go to the university and be loved and welcomed and, and be able to be themselves. And it's really a harsh environment. Um, um, do you have any tips Having gotten so in touch with that environment, what that is nationally, do you have any tips for these very talented but naive freshmen as they go into their classes? What, what should they expect in their new environment? Well, I'm not sure there's any students now going into college that haven't already been exposed to the white hatred that characterizes our, our culture today, or the male hatred. Uh, it's, it's way down into K through 12. Uh, so I think they already know what's going on. I, but I suppose if you've been homeschooled or you've gone to a classical academy, uh, you may not know that. And um, it's very tough. I guess I would say uh, if, if they tell you that you're in a world that is discriminating against people that you don't see as being discriminated against, be skeptical. Uh, don't believe that. You, you know, it's funny because high school students all compare their SATs. We're all living this lie. It's incredible. We're all living this, this fiction uh, that there's no racial preferences, but they all know. You know, they, they know that their black schoolmates got admitted to schools that everybody else got rejected to, and those black classmates had much lower GPAs and SATs, but then we get to college and we're all supposed to pretend that preferences don't exist. And if you talk about them, you're a racist. So that alone kind of gives students a little uh, forewarning about what's about to happen to them. And I guess as far as advice, I would say seek out every literature course you can Try to find any, if they exist, that spend most of the time reading the books, not theory. And, and even if you're reading, if your professor is trying to put on you a, uh, what, what has been called the hermeneutics of suspicion, that is reading allegedly against the grain, th seeing a text as kind of a, a con game that it's trying to cover up its its subtext read with joy read for human experience read for insight and try to stay critical or skeptical of the theory i was not i didn't I, you know I, i'm saying something that i i did not accomplish myself i found I found high theory very seductive, and it seemed like a, a, an, a, a hidden dangerous power that was only given to the, uh, the initiated, you know, the, 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 those in the sacred mystery rites. Um, so I understand the lure of, of the belief that you are in possession of a theory of knowledge that nobody else has. But I wish that I'd spent more time just reading great books and not doing theory. So for students, if, if you can find things that have not been saturated with the identity politics, throw yourselves into it. You're, you're a real supporter of the Western canon, mm -hmm. Western literature, et cetera, et cetera, which supposedly left us in the 80s some point maybe 70s yeah um, <clears throat> okay um, 
Well, I'm going to, let's see how much more time I have. I could ask you another thousand questions, but I'm only going to ask you two or three more. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. Um, um, I have a question here near the end about the future of feminism. Um, and I could elaborate on that. I talk about the first, second, and third wave, and I get the feeling in interviewing some uh, women that there are stirrings there, and um, because of transgenderism and the, the desire to eliminate gender in, across the board into unisex or whatever you want to call it, uh, that it's uh, women are starting to having maybe even found some semblance of equality in the business world. Some. Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe what's, hap what's going to happen there? What's going to happen with feminism? I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I do not consider myself a feminist. I find it boring. I think it's a, uh, a, a mannered discourse at this point. The idea that there is anything other than full sex equality is ridiculous. Females are the beneficiaries of preferences just as much as minorities are. I'm confident that I've been myself put on panels or chosen for things because they needed their damn gender quota. Um, so, and frankly, on average, females are a disaster. They're, they're why the university is going so far left. It's females that are the supporters of speech codes, of this ridiculous conceit of people being injured by ideas and being vulnerable and trauma. You know, the whole, the whole mental health uh, idea that all these students are suffering from, from mental crises. It's BS, but it is a, the, the therapeutic ethos is female driven. They gave us the COVID hysteria. They're taking over the universities and the faculty. The administration is, is overwhelmingly female. Uh, and, and females, on average, and there's many exceptions, but they're not as rational thinkers as males. They're coming into the economics profession now, and it's, you know, they're, they're complaining that it's become so quantitative. Uh, but, you know, so they, they, they want to push back against that. Now, arguably, it is over quantitative. It may be, you know, that they're not doing enough actual empirical work of observing markets. Uh, but still, I'll take the over quantitative over you know, what, what I fear females were going to bring into, which is a much more ideological uh, approach to, to reality. Uh, so, yes, whether, you know, we saw the reaction in Virginia of the elections where we hear that it was the soccer moms who said enough for the indoctrination of, of, of white privilege and, and maybe the transgender stuff. I hope so. But I think that even you know your soccer, not particularly political soccer mom, uh, still holds on to this idea that females are are oppressed in this culture. You know they still want to they still want to think that, and uh, you know for them, abortion is still a very important right. I'm agnostic on it, uh, but but if if it's if there's places where it, it no longer is a right, it's not because of anti-female, it's because of a sincere belief uh, in the sanctity of human life from conception forward, and that's not anti-female, it is simply a different, a different understanding of, of when a human being begins. Uh, so I don't know of whether females will be willing to give up their favored victim status I don't know, but it is very curious. I mean, what one, is, what one observes in our world is the constant churn in the great totem pole of victimhood, and one never knows who's going to be on top at any given point. And what we've learned, interestingly, and this I wouldn't have predicted this, is that females are not necessarily the top dog victims. Uh, now trans are. And so who would have thought that, that so many females would be either complicit in or simply silent about letting males into their daughter's locker rooms uh, and, and, and letting males take over female sports. I love it because 
Females have managed to decimate male f sports in colleges out of Title IX, so you have you know, perfectly viable male, male sports teams being uh, dis dismembered so that we can create some gender equity in sports. So to me, it's, 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 it's fair revenge that now you get some male showing up on the female track team and uh, you know, squashing those female runners uh, because we're supposed to pretend he's a female. Or, you know, I, I, I wish you'd get a whole team of males claiming that they're female, squashing the little female soccer team, you know, that have been doing all their, their, their soccer mom practice to get into Stanford on an athletic scholarship, uh, or softball team for that matter. So it's very interesting that females have not been able to, to defend their own rights against the trans phenomenon. And that is mysterious to me. I think, I think maybe what trans is about is the ultimate wedge against the two-parent nuclear family. And it's, it's, it's the ultimate wedge against male-female differences and there being any kind of normalcy, a normal sexuality where, you know, that no longer is, you can't talk about that anymore. It's all just a series of perversions. And of course, you're not for that. Um, I mean, that, that's obvious. Um, in other words, gender identity is somewhat, maybe that's some natural law you might believe in. I don't know. But anyway. Yeah, sexual. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. gender is even, I, I, I try not to use the word. It's, it's a manufactured word. Yeah. It is already, it already bears the idea that everything is socially constructed. Okay, um, two more questions. I'm just curious what you see. You know, we're early in the decade politics. We've moved along from 2020. We've had a little elect election results from this year. How, how do you, what do you think is going to happen between the blue team and the red team for the next 10 years? Well, I'm a pessimist by nature. I, I think, again, these are some of these divides, like, you know, being for graffiti versus anti graffiti. They're, they're things that are pre-rational and that just determine your outlook. And so I'm inclined to always see the bad things. And I know that there's people that will say, but how can you ignore all the good things? But I look at the world I've been involved in since the 70s and I see no improvement there. I see one long decline. We have won no battles, period. We won welfare reform, which is a different area. Temporarily in the 96, it, did very little. Um, so it's hard for me to see how we get out of the dominance of identity politics. But maybe what it will take, I think, is for whites to say, I refuse to be villainized any longer. But if, if, it's, if it's viewed as unifying rhetoric for Joe Biden to give in his inauguration speech, one long screed against alleged white supremacy, if that's viewed as unifying, if whites are that passive and that willing to be denigrated constantly, it seems to me fair play for there to be some sort of white identity politics, if not inevitable, at some point, maybe not the white elites, but the white working class may say, uh, we refuse to be tarred like this. We're not the problem. Uh, and I think that's what it's gonna take to push back against this fiction that we are a racist society. Uh, but until that happens, if, if the only allowable explanation for racial disparities remains racism, and that is our current state, the only th allowable explanation in the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and MSNBC for the fact that there is a disproportionate number of blacks in prison and an underrepresentation of blacks in Google and at Covington and Burling and at Kleiner Perkins if the only allowable explanation is that there's discrimination against blacks by the police 
or discrimination against black engineers at Google, the left wins and it will continue tearing down every institution of Western civilization in the name of racial equity. The solution to this is to start talking about behavioral disparities, the fact that the black crime rate is astronomical. That's why blacks are disproportionately incarcerated. Nobody would give a damn about so-called mass incarceration if there weren't racial disparities in the prison population. The reaction would be, these criminals, throw them in prison, throw away the key. It's the only reason we're talking about mass incarceration is because of racial disparities. But if we can't say that those disparities arise out of crime, we're gonna continue tearing down the police, we're gonna continue unwinding law enforcement, Crime will continue shooting through the roof. Blacks will be the disproportionate victims of those crimes. And if we can't talk about the academic skills gap, we will continue unwinding meritocratic standards in our institutions and we'll take them down. They're all coming down. We will not much longer have the Washington DC. That will not be allowed. We're already getting rid of Jefferson. We won't have the White House much longer. We'll have to rename that because it's white privilege. It is all coming down. I am, there is no bottom to my pessimism if we can't turn this around. There's not a single institution of American history which will not come down. That's Heather McDonald, best-selling author and the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Join Doug Monroe and keep following us for the latest podcast updates here at Praxis Circle. I'm Maylily Lee. Remember to subscribe or follow Building Worldviews anywhere you listen to podcasts and leave a review. To visit the website, go to praxiscircle.com.